this year's budget will consolidate these gains and particularly focus on strengthening agriculture and rural economy, provision for good health to economically less privileged, taking care of senior citizens, infrastructure creation, and working with the states to provide more resources for improving the quality of education in the country. Now that statement from Finance Minister Arun Jaitley pretty much sums up the budget perfectly. A budget which leaves no question on intent, aimed at rural India, distressed farmers and the urban poor. Is it an election budget, since it's the last full one before the next general elections? Well, if it is, it couldn't have come at a more opportune time for the ruling BJP on a day when they have lost two bipolar elections to the Congress in Rajasthan by huge margins and to the TMC in West Bengal. Can Budget 2018 then convince voters next year that this government will genuinely improve their ease of living and hence should be voted back? Well, that is the key question. And to speak on this, I'm joined this evening by um, BJP MP in the Rajya Sabha, Rajiv Chandrasekhar from the NDA actually, Congress leader Milind Deora, Yogendra Yadav, President of Swaraj India, uh, Siraj Hussain, Senior Fellow at ICRIAR and Editorial Director of the Quint Sanjay Pugalia. Welcome all and thank you for joining us uh, this evening to discuss Budget 2018, which is looking like a lead into the strategy for election 2019. Would I be wrong to say that, Mr. Chandrasekhar? I'll begin with you. No, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't characterize it as an election budget. Uh, I would characterize it as a, as a budget that is probably the last budget before the election. But I think the budget pretty much uh, continues uh, what the, uh, this government started in 2014, which is slowly and systematically rebuilding the economy and transforming it in you know, slow and steady stages. Um, there was obviously, as you know, there was a uh, requirement and a cry for uh, transition support to the agriculture and the MSME sectors, and those have been, uh, you know, effectively dealt with in the budget. So, I don't want to just lump it all into a characterization that this is an election budget. It is clearly a budget that will take this government into the election. Um, Mr. Deora, clearly a budget which will not allow opposition parties like the Congress to call this a suit boot ki sarkar. The focus is clear, the intent is clear. The question, of course, is about implementation. See, firstly, uh, you know, I've, I became an MP the first time in 2004 and I've had the opportunity to see many budgets. Um, I, I personally feel there is so much hype around the economics of a budget, which essentially is a once in a year event where the finance minister is speaking about the income and expenditure of the government of India, the government's financial intention going forward, its taxation policies. I think in this budget, it's unfair to just judge the government's performance based on the statement that the, and the presentation that the finance minister made this morning. It's important to look at its tenure for the last three and a half to four years. And the fact is that this government is the first government after 30 years that had an absolute majority. It had 280 seats in parliament. Any political party requires 272 seats. Um, it had the tailwinds of low oil prices. It had a lot of flexibility, a lot more flexibility than UPA had, mind you. And I think in that sense, it's been a disappointing four years on the part of this government. Um, to me, they failed at many levels, but the big headline items are the fact that they implemented a decision like demonetization, which was completely unnecessary. It was a massive assault on the economy. It hurt demand, it hurt consumption, it hurt growth. It obviously hurt employment generation. And now you're seeing in the last two budgets, the government playing catch up. Um, the second big piece, according to me at a personal level, is the fact that when a government like this has such a massive and transformational mandate, why they did not go ahead and disinvest loss-making PSUs. Today, if you look at the finance minister's statement where he said that we've achieved our target, the target that he had set uh, for himself and for the government last year, which was 72,500 crore rupees, uh, Almost 60% of that target is the sale of 51% of HPCL, a state-owned PSU, 
to ONGC and other state-owned PSU. It's like saying I've received money, but I've invested that money through another pocket. It's like one, one, one stream of income coming into one pocket and another stream of income going out of one pocket. That actually doesn't qualify as disinvestment. You're not reducing the inefficiencies in the system. Okay. You're not reducing the inefficiencies in the fact that the government cannot run these companies. And where the government could have made a lot of money and could have spent that money actually on boosting uh, rural demand. Um, in building infrastructure. So I think right now the government, after demonetization, the fact that they were unable to implement Narendra Modi's election slogan of minimum government, maximum governance, is now finding itself in a corner and it's playing a catch-up game. Uh, you know, I want to focus on two uh, big ticket items uh, or, or policies uh, which were announced in this budget and I want to come to Yogendra Yadav for this because uh, this government is now talking about implementing, Mr. Yadav, what farmer groups and leaders like yourself have been asking for, which is cost price plus 50%. Uh, they are saying that they will put that uh, in place. There's a slew of announcements for the agricultural sector. One thing is for sure, you cannot say that this government is not focused on the agricultural sector. I'm always amazed by how easy it is to dupe and mislead the media, especially the English-speaking media, on agriculture. If I did something like this on shareholders, if I said, I love shareholders of this world, they have taken this country forward and give them nothing, you would take me to pieces. But I can do that with agriculture give some nice shero shari, some nice dialogues a tier and two, and nothing else is required. How do you judge a budget? You judge it by its allocations. You judge not by where the mouth is, but where the money is. So my question is, do we have greater allocation for agriculture than we had yesterday? The answer is no, in percentage terms. Has agriculture got greater share of the budget than before? The answer is no. Have we got a big boost to irrigation which was required? The answer is no. Do we have a major step towards foolproofing the country about disasters of the kind that Economic Survey has talked about? The answer is no. Have we received a loan waiver of the kind the farmers in this country wanted? The answer is no. Finally, what do we have? One declaration that farmers will get cost plus 50 percent. You are right. That's exactly what farmers have been demanded for 11 years. But this is the grand illusion. This is misleading and I dare say this is just plain and simple lying to the country. The Swaminathan Commission which began this formula of cost plus 50 percent had clearly defined what cost was and it clearly said it was C2 which is a comprehensive assessment of cost which is done by CACP. Now and that's precisely why Mr. Narendra Modi went around the country in 2013-14 saying Congress doesn't give you 50% on cost, I'll give you. Four years, they can't implement it. And in the fifth year, what do they do? They change the goalpost. They change the definition of what is cost. It is now reduced to a partial cost called A2, F, uh, A2 plus FL. My simple question is, Mr. Jaitley, if A2 plus FL is the cost that you had in mind all these years, why did your Prime Minister have to go all over the country saying Congress doesn't give you 50%? I have a table with me which actually shows what the Congress did and what the NDA has done. The simple answer is, in its five years, the UPA 2 gave 50% plus on most uh, A2, uh, on A2 plus FL, they gave 50% plus on most crops. There was no need for this halabulla. there was no need for anything of this court. If Mr. Jaitley is simply saying, I'll try and achieve what UPA 2 had already achieved five years ago, well, and if you want me to clap about it, you're asking too much. But if the simple question is, what is it that the farmers wanted? They wanted C2 plus 50%. That has not been done. Farmers wanted a statutory guarantee that MSP should not remain a policy which the government can play with at its own will. No addressing of that. Farmers wanted some way of the deficit. If, if prices fall below MSP, either there should be market intervention or there should be deficit payment. Nothing of that sort done. What do we hear? We hear from the finance minister that he will speak to Niti Aayog, which will speak to states to try and find a solution. I'm sorry, I don't listen to budget speeches okay, to get assurances of this kind. No, I look at budget speech Mr. for Mr. Yadav, specific just, policy just direction to, and allocations. Sure, fair points there, but just to sort of uh, 
ask, what would you have done in this situation? There is a problem of finances. The fiscal deficit, uh, uh, there has been some slippage. Targets have not been met. The government has to also allocate these funds. Would it really be practical to announce whole-scale farm loan waivers? Would you have been able to do that if you were in Mr. Jaitley's position today? Uh, allow, allow me to ask you a question. I didn't manage to watch your channel all the time. But when the government announced 7th Pay Commission and when they gave 1 lakh crore rupees additional ev every year to that, did your channel ask this question? Can the country afford it? Do we have finances? It's all about priorities. And this is about political will. What matters to you? For me, 54% of this pop population of the country matters. For me, that would have been the first priority. I would think twice before bank recapitalization because that was 2 lakh crore rupees basically as a loan waiver. This was a loan waiver given to the corporates. I would think about it. I would think about a, a bullet train. I would reprioritize. Yes, it's not easy. Yes, it is about saying what matters to me most. And if farmers really mattered most, then we wouldn't have this kind of a budget. I'm afraid what I see in this budget today is farmers don't matter. Modi government couldn't care less. They know that you really don't have to do much for the farmers in order to get their votes. Mr. Sen, unfortunately, you did not hear Yogendra Yadav's comments earlier and maybe a bit of what Rajiv Chandrasekhar was saying. But a fresh perspective from you on whether this government has actually done enough to ease farm distress, uh, rural distress. You and I spoke before the budget as well on this and you had your perspective. What is your uh, you know, opinion on what the finance minister has announced today? You see, the uh, finance minister has announced a number of steps which can address the rural distress to some extent, uh, but it would be presumptuous on my part to say that uh, the issue is entirely addressed. Uh, because in any case, uh, the problems relating to Indian agriculture and Indian rural sector are so complex that we should not expect one budget to address all the issues. Uh, however, uh, a number of new uh, funds have been uh, announced and even though adequate budgetary provision has, no, has not been made for those funds, uh, for example, the dairy and livestock fund, uh, etc. Uh, however, I do feel that uh, it will help uh, the farmers to some extent to diversify their occupation and to earn some extra income from dairy, fisheries, FPOs, etc. So it is a step in the right direction. However, a lot more needs to be done. Rajiv Chandrasekhar, one uh, uh, class of Indians uh, who are possibly uh, not uh, in the uh, you know catchment area of big voters but definitely are very vocal is the middle class who today is saying especially on social media that we've got a raw deal uh, that GST was supposed to widen the tax base and give us some kind of uh, benefits and that hasn't happened instead there's 1% uh, more of cess uh, if they're investing in uh, equity linked schemes then there's long term capital gains tax import duties have increased increased on uh, a number of items of you know urban consumption as well uh, is that going to be a sore point no i think look uh, I, I think uh, they have uh, some reason to be disappointed that uh, there was no uh, h higher ceiling on tax exemption on personal tax exemption but uh, there is a you know 40000 rupees exemption for the salaried class uh, that should, uh, in some sense, provide some sucker. But please, uh, let's look at one, one. The other thing that you mentioned about GST, which is the whole indirect taxation that really affects every middle class person for all of their purchases of goods and services. That is now pretty much out of the budget into the GST council. And over the years, as you've seen in the last few months, the GST Council will continuously rationalize what the GST slabs will be and the economic survey and the chief economic advisor has said in a few days ago that he expects the GST to actually converge into a structure where there will be only three numbers and three slabs. So I think GST clearly is a work in progress. 
I suspect that in the financial year 18, 19, we will see uh, much more uh, rationalization of GST and lowering of rates as the indirect tax base expands. The economic survey is indicating that the indirect tax base is expanding fairly rapidly. So uh, that is something that the middle class can look forward to. Uh, it, of course, to answer your question, did they get an income tax slab reduction? No. But I think that is something now that we should not expect. We should expect more of a gradual rationalization as the tax base and the indirect tax base increases of rates that will impact the salaried and the uh, middle class. You know, Milan, I want to come back to uh, the focus of uh, this budget and let's talk about it a bit in the context of uh, uh, the political impact of it uh, up ahead into 2019 and state elections later this year. Uh, would you uh, admit that the government has managed to strike the right note of at least telling potential viewers that not only are we implementing large-scale schemes successfully and the finance minister spoke about schemes like Ujwal, uh, Ujwala and Jandhan Yojana, DBT, etc. But we are also focusing on the section of society that needs help the most. That message has gone out clearly. Also another interesting thing, a lot of the schemes have an end date of 2022 uh, or 2021. Uh, um, subliminal message there that this government will continue ahead of 2019 see the 2022 vision 2022 is a sort of is a is a jumla that's the best thing i can say about it actually the most generous words i can use to describe it but as i said i've seen enough budgets where including my own government where we make these statements you do try and address concerns of aggrieved uh, parties and communities. You do try and address them directly through the budget. It is, in a sense, a State of the Union address by the finance minister of the country. But ultimately, people aren't seeing that trickle down on the ground. So when, when, you, when you're saying that uh, the finance minister has spoken about rural distress, and as my friend Rajiv said, they're trying to restructure the business model of agriculture, these are not things to sell to the people of India and those who are watching, I'm not even sure how many Indians actually watch uh, the union budget presentation, but for those who do, is that something that's going to convince them and say, I'm in serious distress right now, but because the finance minister and subsequently the prime minister have addressed my community, have said the word rural five times, have said the word Mumbai twice, I'm going to vote for them, I'm going to support them. No, it doesn't work like that. Ultimately, it's based on the economy. It's based on how many jobs are being created, how much demand there is, how much consumption there is, how much economic activity there is, whether it's in the organized sector or in the unorganized sector. And right now, the economy is picking up, but it's very, very slow. And I come back to my initial point that it's unfair to judge this government's performance based on a budget presentation made a few hours ago. It's important to judge this government's performance based on promises made four years ago and the implementation of the last four years. And I believe, and I come back to the point that this government has wasted a historic opportunity. It was historic because after three decades, you had a government with an absolute majority in parliament. You had, as I said again, the tailwinds of low oil prices, something the UPA 1 and UPA 2 could not boast of. We had to function within that environment, and yet we allowed the economy to grow. We reduced rural distress. We created employment, attracted foreign investment. Stock yeah. markets grew. All of that happened. We, we recorded, uh, we, we clocked record growth rates in our country. So we managed to keep the economy going. This government, as I said, also had an unnecessary burden of demonetization, which may not necessarily be the finance minister's fault. It's something he inherited and had to implement and had to then go out and defend. So I think this room, this government has very little room now just the optics and semantics of saying rural five times in my speech, um, saying farmers three yeah. times in my speech, saying senior citizens two times in my speech, is not going to win you an election or convince the electorate that you fail to deliver on your promises. Okay, so going by that, uh, going, uh, going by that uh, yardstick, one must assume that no finance minister has ever thought of a voter base while uh, presenting a budget. I think that would be a far stretch of the imagination for anyone sitting on this panel. Milind, even you would agree that uh, uh, finance ministers are uh, somewhere at the back of their mind thinking about potential voters. Uh, and uh, in that context, what about a mammoth... No, I'm not denying that. I'm not saying that the finance minister would not want to address a particular community. Yes. But if in this government, unfortunately, the nature of this government is 
is the finance minister empowered to take all decisions relating to the economy? Was the finance minister consulted, for example, on demonetization? How much did that impact the finance minister's plans of actually achieving his own personal goals for the economy? So that's another question we, this government has to answer. Okay. In previous governments, including BJP-run governments, finance ministers were given the power to implement um, their vision of what the economy should look like, the contours of the economy, reach out to particular constituencies, could be rural, could be middle class, whatever that may be. But that's a problem of this government. This, I think, knowing the finance minister, I think the finance minister would have liked to disinvest much faster than he was permitted to do. I think the finance minister perhaps would not have been an advocate of demonetization, but it's something he's inherited. And it's something which has hurt growth rates in India, employment, demand and consumption. And now he has to move and function within a limited amount of space available. All I'm saying is given that amount of space, that limited amount of space, which has shrunk considerably in spite of massive tailwinds, I'm not quite sure if a political party in the last year of its term makes these lofty promises and gives lip service to certain communities that they're going to actually get their votes in a, a, a year later in an election. That's the larger point I'm trying to make. All right. Mr. Chandrasekhar, I, I, I wouldn't call it a lofty pro promise, but it's a big promise, uh, and that is universal health cover. When you're saying that you're going to give 10 crore poor families health cover of 5 lakh rupees each, um, that's, that's a huge promise. How much do you think it will resonate uh, with people? And do you think that there should have at least been a bit more clarity of the hows and whys uh, of, of this scheme? How is it going to be imp implemented? Is the government going to pay the premiums? Um, is there going to be a reimbursement of sorts? Who will it extend to? Do you think those details were missing? No, Tomala, before I before I respond to that question, can I just respond to yes. Milan yes. about uh, his uh, his narrative of the government and the, po and the politics and the budget? Sure. Uh, you know, I I am saying this with uh, Milan as a friend, but I have to say this because I think uh, he wants uh, he, you know the Congress is heavily invested in this belief that public memory is very short, and that uh, you know they they would like people to believe that 2014. The Manmohan Singh government left this economy in, in fine fet fettle and uh, essentially Mr. Narendra Modi and Arun Jaitley have run it to the ground. It's an interesting narrative, but they'll, they'll find very few takers for that. Let's really understand, in 2014, the fiscal deficit was out of control. There were 12 successive quarters of GDP decline and 24 quarters of uncontained uh, inflation. There was an NPA crisis that was fully blown and there was an investor a confidence level that was rock bottom. It is from there that the economy has been built up. Now, he talks about tailwinds of low petroleum prices. He should know that in 2014 May, when this government took over, the oil marketing companies were all completely almost on the brink of bankruptcy because of all of the additional debt that they had taken on. It is the oil marketing companies that have benefited from the low fuel prices and have rebuilt their balance sheet into a stage where today they are standing alone on their own. The fiscal deficit from 2014 has moved down steadily to a, to a point where inflation and the fiscal metrics are under control. Now we are at 3.5 moving to 3.3. So these are the realities, the harsh realities that we need to sometimes represent to the Congress when they are on this bandwagon of trying to characterize this as a major conspiracy in, between a willing PM and an unwilling finance minister. No, no. So let me just finish. So I, let's, be, let's, let's understand the facts. This government has brought back the economy and we are today at a stage, okay, I am willing to concede that this is, we could have done more in the last three years and that is an academic discussion. Can we have done more? Yes, maybe we could have done more. Could we have done more reforms? Yes, we could have done more reforms. But that is an academic discussion, but we cannot argue with the fact that in 2018, the economy is in a different, much better place than it was in 2014, number one. Number two, let me answer your question on the health scheme that was unveiled by the finance minister. I think it is a brilliant scheme. It is a, it's, a, it's an excellent scheme. It is moving towards universal health coverage. It, it addresses the 10 crore families and the 50 crore uh, members or Indians that will benefit from it. But between the announcement the, and actual ag execution, I would have also liked the budget to talk about the roadmap yes. to making this 
really being implemented. It is a powerful program. It is a game changer for the, uh, the segments of our society that have been denied health access for all these years. But where are the ho which which hospitals Absolutely. who will enroll who I'm will supervise sure. and how will this be available and uh, uh, made available to the families are details that should have been in passing glad, at least referred I'm, I'm to in the budget. I'm glad you admit that. But I suspect that these will quickly come out. Okay, I'm glad you admit that, Milin. Yeah, yeah, I admit your to counter. facts. Yeah, can I come in? Yes, yes, please. No, no, firstly, I don't want to go into the politics of the NDA. Um, all I want to say is that ultimately this government has failed to make use of its historic mandate. That's my larger point that I'm making and I repeat. And Rajiv himself has conceded that the government could have done a lot more. But in simply conceding as a spokesperson of the government of the party in power, saying we could have done a lot more is not enough. The point is you did implement demonetization which has caused massive distress to the economy. It was unnecessary by all estimates. By privately friends, my friends in BJP, my friends in government say it was the silliest decision we ever implemented. It's hurt the economy. Similarly on disinvestment, you're suddenly the government has woken up to saying, now let's go ahead and disinvest aggressively. For the first three years, mind you, Tamanna, the prime minister himself on record said, I'm not in favor of disinvestment. I'm in favor of improving productivity and in the way these companies are run, which we all know ultimately, no matter even if the prime minister himself became the CEO of Air India or of BSNL or of, or of MTNL, May I just he will not be able to perform as well as the private sector because there are inherent inefficiencies in government owning these companies. Now, one more thing, this universal healthcare idea, because I was just hearing the response. Yeah. I think it's a welcome idea. I think it's a great idea. It's something we should all be proud of and welcome. And we won't play politics on it. It is on paper, in theory, uh, the, the world's largest healthcare scheme. It's certainly bigger than what Obamacare was, universal yeah. healthcare was in the United States. Um, and we welcome that. But remember, and I'm coming, I speak from, as a, a former minister from the state of Maharashtra, Maharashtra was one of the first states to implement a scheme similar to this. It was done during a Congress government almost 10 years ago. The question in this, the, the, the problem in this scheme, and I, and I said I welcome it fundamentally, but where we all as policymakers have to work towards ensuring its success, and simply just making an announcement it is not going to mean that 50 crore people in India are going to get insured and avail of this service. We have to A, increase awareness about it. Okay. Most Indians don't you know, even I know just, about I just want to come in, Milan. I just, Secondly, I just like want to come said, in. I just, I just want to come in on if two points you made. the the insurance premium, what happens with private insurance companies, with sure. public insurance companies? Sure, sure. I just want what to come in. What kind of coverage are we talking about? Absolutely. Is everything from a cold, a common cold to cancer come on, in I, this? I want to come in as well. And those no, are the okay. details which are very, very, very and important to ensure exactly. that a scheme as important as this as large as this, as all-encompassing as this, is made successful. No, exactly. And Rajiv also agreed to that point. We've all made that point that details need to come. Perhaps they will. But I just wanted to come in, Milind, on two things you said. You're talking about demonetization. The BJP won uh, a, a landslide victory after demonetization in Uttar Pradesh. GST, you did not mention, but that is another criticism uh, in terms of implementation of this government. It has not dented their political victory in Gujarat. So, Disinvestment is a key point. If I'm talking about this in a political no, context, I? it may not matter. Today, when you're sitting after this budget, looking at 2019, no, 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 you have to admit that their messaging is right. Just a quick word from Milan, and then I'll come to Rajiv. No, Taman, I mean, look, this whole, this whole thing of demonetization, been having given the stamp of approval of the Indian electorate is a farce. I'm sorry to say that, because during the same phase when there were elections in several states, BJP won at Uttar Pradesh, but in the same election it lost Manipur, it lost Goa and it lost Punjab. Surely Punjab uses the Indian rupee and the same cash that Uttar Pradesh does. Surely Manipur and Goa also use the same rupee and the same denomination notes that, that Uttar Pradesh does. We will see the effects of the economy's sluggish growth rates, um, poor employment generation playing out in the political space as well. Okay. And simply Wait, the Rajiv's rhetoric coming. of the government in saying we've given lip service to particular communities will only take them so far. All right. Yes, Rajiv. 
No, Tamanna. So uh, let me uh, say off right off the bat that I have been a supporter and a proponent of demonetization as a structural reform, mm -hmm. and I don't want to go into the uh, the reasons and rationale in too much detail. But the 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 fallout of demonetization are very significant and very visible. India has always been a country with low tax to GDP ratio. The tax compliance in this country has been extremely poor. And therefore, the dependence on indirect taxation and high indirect taxation, whether it's GST or excise duty or uh, CST. Demonetization was necessary because the cash to GDP ratio had reached absurd levels. We were creating an almost parallel economy. And I won't get into the, the merits and demerits of black money. But the structural reform is essentially spurred the transition of, from cash to digital economy. Have we gotten there fully yet? No. It will require a series of incentives over the next three or four or five years for to make digital economy and non-cash become larger and larger parts of our economy. And the important part of it, it is this, that the tax to GDP ratio is already showing significant growth from 60 lakhs to 80, uh, sorry, from 6 crores to 8 crores. So, that is an important objective for any right thinking government that we've got to have a country of a billion point three people, one point three billion. You know, people. I just want to I we just want to refocus uh, this conversation. Sure, I just I just let me allow me, yes, gentlemen, to yep. let me just allow me just re, to refocus no, this I conversation. I just wanted to make the point that no no Tamana, I just want to make the point. I just want to make the point that while the Congress has is entitled to its view on demonetization, yes. there is a very legitimate counter view to the merits of demonetization. All right. We, uh, honestly, I want to refocus this conversation because we're not no, going into the ask details Rajiv of. Can a question, Tamanna? Uh, no, let me let me just bring in Sanjay Pugalia as well. Give me a second, minute. Let me just bring in Sanjay Pugalia as well and attempt to refocus this conversation uh, to what Budget 2018 is telling us about what's happening in 2019. Let's bring into context. Rajasthan bypose 3 nil in favor of the Congress in West Bengal. Mamta Di is riding high uh, to zero, though the BJP is uh, second in line. Congress is slid to fourth. In that context, uh, Sanjay, how are you looking at this budget? Has Mr. Jaitley said enough to convince a large voter base to come back to the BJP in 2019? Tamanna uh, uh, is very clean. हिंदी में जेटली जी को बार-बार शिफ्ट होना पड़ रहा था आमतौर पर इंग्लिश में स्पीच होती है और उसमें हिंदी का ट्रांसलेशन हम सुनते हैं तो पूरा इंग्लिश चला उसके बाद प्रधानमंत्री जी का सबसे लंबा भाषण था यह आपको बड़ी साफ तौर पर बताता है कि नर्वसनेस क्या है और एंजाइटी क्या है और किन-किन कंस्टिट्यूएंसीज को कितने जोर से मार्केट करना है अपने प्लान्स को लेकर के तो इलेक्शन की चिंता से ये बजट शुरू हुआ है और इलेक्शन की चिंता पर ही ये बजट खत्म हुआ है जब आपको बताया जाता है कि 10 करोड़ परिवारों को इंश्योरेंस दिया जाएगा 50 करोड़ लोग उसके बेनिफिशियरी हो सकते हैं सबसे बड़ा अनाउंसमेंट पर सबसे छोटा पैराग्राफ आप पढ़ते हैं प्रीमियम कौन देगा लागू कैसे होगा सरकार पैसे लगाएगी क्या 5 लाख की पॉलिसी का मतलब होता है मार्केट रेट के हिसाब से करीबन 25000 रुपए का सालाना प्रीमियम और अगर वो मुझे ही खरीदना है अगर मैं बीपीएल का व्यक्ति हूं तो फिर मैं खरीदूं कि नहीं खरीदूं ये डिटेलिंग इसमें नहीं है तो आप समझ लीजिए कि अनाउंसमेंट के पीछे मकसद क्या है तो ये आप लोग अटकलें लगा सकते हैं कि चुनाव कब होगा प्रीपोन तो नहीं हो जाएगा वो तो मैं नहीं कह सकता हूं लेकिन ये शुद्ध रूप से चुनाव पर टारगेटेड बजट है कि बहुत सारा पैसा डायरेक्ट बेनिफिट ट्रांसफर आप हमसे ले लीजिए और बहुत सारा वोट ट्रांसफर आप हमको कर दीजिए you know, uh, we touched upon the point of the lack of details uh, on the uh, ins health insurance scheme a little while earlier and that's actually been echoed uh, by Sanjay as well. Uh, but uh, Milinda, uh, your comment, and I'm, I'm going to make this a closing comment from all uh, the panelists. Um, right now, you have uh, a bipolar election win which uh, the Congress President has also praised on Twitter, uh, a shot in the arm, but it's nearly, not nearly enough to find yourself in a strong position. This budget, at the very least, tells you that the government of the day has realized that a certain part of the population, farmers, may be angry and they're keen to address those issues. I would, I would agree with that and I would say that um, 
um, the, the budget is not going to make a political impact. It's not going to win an election, lose an election, uh, improve the tally or reduce the tally. Um, but certainly it's a, it's a statement of intent on the part of the government. It's a, it's a statement of admission on the part of the government that they have made mistakes and they have ignored certain sectors and that their policies haven't worked. And it's had a detrimental impact, for instance, on the rural community, um, that senior citizens are going through a tough time. So there, there, there is an admission uh, in, the, in the France minister's speech. Is it going to lead to any electoral impact? I honestly doubt. All right, uh, Rajiv, what are the big challenges up ahead for this government? Uh, we've seen some inkling of it in Rajasthan, so that could have other factors in it as well, including uh, how that particular government, the Rajasthan government, is functioning. Uh, but there is a sense of nervousness, you would admit? No, so I think let me just answer the same question that you posed to Milind as well. Uh, I think it is clear from the Gujarat election that the government was caught flat-footed by the angst and the anger from the, both the farming community and the MSMEs. And I think this budget has responded to that. Uh, you can argue that it is belated, late, on time, whatever. So we will not go down that road. But that these two uh, segments of our economy were feeling pain and the government needed to do, act, do something about it. That was loud and clear and uh, the government responded. Uh, in terms of the Rajasthan by-election, look, I think any by-election that is lost by a, a sitting government is bad news. So I think the fact that the Rajasthan government on its watch has lost three elections today is not good news for that government. Um, uh, you know, I'm hoping, obviously, as a member of the NDA, that it is more to do with the incumbency of the local government rather than a wider phenomenon because we have an election coming up uh, in a few months in Karnataka. Uh, and then we have elections four or five months later in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, and other states. So uh, the 18-19 political landscape will, in a sense, set the tone for the 2019 election. Uh, and there are five elections in this, in this financial year. And those will be all, each one of them will be important uh, to determine the outcome of what uh, will be the results in 2019. Um, you know, last comment uh, from you, uh, Sanjay. Uh, what are the factors that should make this government nervous right now and which they need to address very quickly? Have we seen a roadmap to that, at least in this budget? Uh, yeah, clearly. Just target the mass voter, uh, mainly women, senior citizens, and uh, MSME, of course, and farmers. Farmer wale mein bhi wahi issue hai ki किस तरीके से स्कीम पैन आउट होगी उसका कुछ पता नहीं है तो एक जो होता है कोई चीज चांस पे नहीं छोड़ना है तमन्ना वही कोशिश इन्होंने की है लेकिन ये कितना पे ऑफ करेगा कहना बहुत मुश्किल है जो एंगस्ट है वो बड़ा सिंपल है कि जिस गरीब फोकस्ड पॉलिटिक्स को मोदी जी की सरकार ने परस्यू किया है वो गांव और गरीब पूरी तरह से साथ नहीं दे रहा है गुजरात ने बताया और आज राजस्थान ने बताया बहुत कम होता है कि इनकम्बेंट गवर्नमेंट किसी बाई इलेक्शन को हारे और इस तरह की मार्जिन के साथ हारे तो यही इनको टेंशन बहुत ज्यादा है लेकिन कह करके फील गुड कराना और किसी इंसान का वोटर का खुद फील गुड महसूस करना इन दोनों में बहुत फर्क है इस फर्क को मोदी जी की सरकार जानती है उसी को ये कोशिश कर रहे हैं किसी तरीके से मिक्स कर दिया जाए और लोगों को एहसास करा दिया जाए कि बहुत अच्छा है और शॉकिंगली क्योंकि कुछ भी इस मेगा ब्रांड के तहत बात होती है तो वो एम्पलीफाई बहुत होता है शॉकिंगली इस बजट में जॉब पर डायरेक्ट एड्रेस बहुत कम किया गया है क्योंकि आप जॉब पर डिबेट करना नहीं चाहते जॉब पर आप ज्यादा बोलेंगे तो फिर उसका रिएक्शन आएगा बातें होंगी तो ये बजट ये जो बजट का भाषण था उसमें जॉब पर शांति थी तो शायद गरीब बीपीएल किसान को तो एड्रेस कर लिया बेरोजगारी को एड्रेस नहीं कर पाए हैं उसके लिए नए नए गोल पोस्ट दिए जा रहे हैं सेल्फ एम्प्लॉयमेंट जॉब सीकर नहीं जॉब गिवर लेकिन ये सब मुझे लगता है कि इसकी कोई कॉन्क्रीट स्कीम हो और उसका कोई लॉजिकल स्ट्रक्चर हो फाउंडेशन हो वो नहीं दिखता और इस बीच मिडिल क्लास का क्या एंड आई विल एंड विद दैट थॉट दैट द सैलरीड मिडिल क्लास टुडे इज वंडरिंग व्हाई दे हैव बीन लेफ्ट आउट ऑफ द पार्टी एट ऑल एंड्स बट परहैप्स दे आर नॉट द बिगेस्ट कैचमेंट बेस एज फार एज वोटर्स गो सो दे विल हैव टू सिट ऑन द साइड लाइंस फॉर अ बिट थैंक यू सो मच फॉर जॉइनिंग अस इन दिस कन्वर्सेशन टुडे संजय पगलिया राजीव चंद्रशेखर एंड मिलिंद देरा वी वर डिस्कसिंग द पॉलिटिकल इंपैक्ट ऑफ बजट 2018 क्लियरली अ रोड मैप हैज बीन लेड आउट Uh, leading up to 2019 will those big 
schemes show some kind of an impact before the big elections, then is the next question.